Thank you very much indeed. This is a truly amazing event. Um, just to be in this building for two days is a privilege in itself without um, actually doing any work. Um, I am hugely grateful to the organizing committee for the invitation um, and it feels like a, a great honor. Um, my intention today is to explore the ways in which these three intertwined and mutually reinforcing trends, the medicalization of life, the industrialization of healthcare, and the politicization of medicine, with ever increasing surveillance and control of biometric diversity, weight, blood pressure, bone density, depression score, cholesterol, etc., 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 are actively promoting disease and the fear of disease, and so spoiling our lives. The driving force of medicalization is fear. The age-old human fear of the future. And within contemporary Western society, there is very little place for the existential human fear of suffering and death. No shared ritual available to contain and channel it. And we are bombarded with information about risks to our health and what we, are, we should be doing about them. This is a cartoon, I hope you can see it. This is a cartoon with the radio bringing you news of fresh worries every day. <laughs> Filling the gap between our existential fears and, 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 and the abyss, um, illness has become one of the very few valid and acceptable outlets for distress in our society. In the English language, we can draw a very useful distinction between illness, which is the subjective experience of something being wrong with your body or your mind, and disease, which is the scientific classification that medicine has developed to try and understand and ameliorate the human experience of illness. So you have an illness when you go to see the doctor and you have a disease when you come back. So so you go with a sore throat, you come back with tonsillitis. You go with chest pain and you come back with a myocardial infarction. Today, although we are living longer and there is less rather than more untimely disease, doctors are asked to respond to more illness and more fear. Simultaneously, the rhetoric of preventive health care is ever more popular with politicians and journalists both trading consciously or unconsciously on the universality of human fear. Illness is much more extensive than disease, but fear permeates both. Global capitalism is opening up the whole arena of human health for the pursuit of profit, trading on human fear in an explicit and calculated manner. People living in the richer countries of the world are now living healthier and longer lives than ever before in history, and the majority are fit and well. Only a minority are sick, and so the profit to be made by developing and selling treatments for the sick is limited. There is clearly much more money to be made by convincing the healthy majority of the immediacy of threats to their health and the need to take action to avert or minimize these. The trouble with always trying to preserve the health of the body is that it is so difficult to do so without destroying the health of the mind. The problem is that an obsession with health is destructive of it. This is Amartya Sen, the great Nobel Prize winning economist, and he has drawn attention to the inverse relationship between life expectancy and rates of self-reported illness. In an, in an article in the British Medical Journal in April 2002, he compared India and the United States. Now, Bihar, uh, top on the green, is the uh, poorest state in India, and Kerala down here is, uh, although it looks tiny here, has a population the size of Canada's. 
Um, and Kerala is the state which has invested most heavily in education, especially for women, and which has achieved highest rates of literacy. And this is Sen's diagram showing life expectancy for males and females in India compared with the United States. And predictably, this is lowest in Bihar, the poorest state in India. It's highest in the US, with Kerala punching well above its economic weight. But this is the paradox. These are the rates of self-reported illness. Worryingly low in Bihar, where people are obviously too busy struggling to survive to notice whether they feel ill or not. And quite ridiculously high in the US. And this leads to the uncomfortable discovery that the more people are exposed to contemporary healthcare systems, the less well they perceive themselves to be. The more people are exposed to the machinations and the surveillance of healthcare, the more they perceive themselves to be sick and at risk, and the highest, higher the rates of self reported illness become. This is the wonderful Michel de Montaigne, who pointed out the risks of modern medicine more than four centuries ago. The problem was no one was listening. He wrote, if they do no other good, they do at least this, that they prepare their patients early for death, undermining little by little and cutting off their enjoyment of life. We are living longer than ever before. <laughs> enjoying unprecedented levels of physical health, and yet perceive ourselves to be ill. This must surely have something to do with the insistence of preventive medicine and the constant injunctions to look out for the early symptoms of disease and to accept screening tests. Fear pervades health and the length of life seems to be valued more than its intensity or achievements. The metric, thank you very much, the metric of preventive medicine is length of life, and it seems to have no way of accommodating other values. And in the name of this endeavor, our lives are subjected to greater surveillance than ever before. With the widespread expectations of a long and healthy life, fear becomes transformed into greed. And an ever greater uh, appetite for consuming healthcare resources at the expense of poorer and sicker people, both globally and within nations. The largely unexamined conviction that prevention is better than cure provides a moral justification for systematic diversion of healthcare resources from the sick to the well. The economic imperatives of the pharmaceutical industries drive the rhetoric and orchestrate ever-increasing demands for healthcare technologies. And it is in the interest of the medical industrial complex for illness and disease to be located within individuals, to be divorced from their social and political context, and these interests are well served by the presentation of health issues in the media. The individualization of illness allows the focus to be on the biological and behavioral determinants of health, and the discourse of health risk is used to enable both the surveillance and the blaming of the unfortunately sick victim. Risk discourse is redolent with the ideologies of mortality, danger, and divine retribution. Good place for that. Risk as it is used in modern society therefore cannot be considered a neutral term. The rhetoric of risk trades on a politics of responsibility which turns an increasingly oppressive, which becomes an increasingly oppressive social obligation. We are encouraged to be afraid or ashamed of what we eat and drink and breathe and to avoid a whole panoply of different risks and to lead ever more regulated lives devoid of fun and thrills. Market forces drive the standardization of uh, goods and services in order to facilitate their free movement across borders. We all know that in the EU. And as healthcare has been more and more opened up to market forces, 
we have seen the increasing standardization of both diagnostic categories and of recommended treatments. Um, and it seems that we almost can't begin to address suffering unless we have applied a standardized label to it and then we can proceed from that. This is the industrialization of healthcare. This is something that reduces every patient uh, to a unit of health need and every healthcare professional to a unit of healthcare provision, all of which are interchangeable as cogs in a large system. As a result of the bureaucratization which is being forced on medical practice as a consequence of the logic of capitalist expansion, physicians are slowly being reduced to a proletarian function. The words of the moment have become information and choice. And it is no coincidence that these are the requirements of an algorithm. The illusion is that if patients can be supplied with information and choice, they can make their own way through the algorithms of healthcare without the need of doctors. The systematic deception is that medicine is simple and linear and can be reduced to a series of robust guidelines and that there is a right answer in any given situation. All this is based on a false certainty which knows what it knows but is dangerously unaware of what it does not know. Strict adherence to guidelines for fear of risk should not be allowed to stifle innovative practice or the patient's choice of alternative therapeutic solutions to the same problem. There are clear dangers that the rigid application of protocols based on population data to individuals and the increasingly heavy hand of bureaucracy seems likely to impede sensitivity, flexibility, and even innovation in the delivery of care. The standardization of medical practice is welcomed as a way of eliminating the worst of practice, but it may also eliminate the best, and that may not be a good deal uh, for society. It says 10 there, and you're saying five. Contradictory, but I'll do my best. <laughs> Um, uh, all, all of this is related to the vexed issue of clinical freedom. Current deprecation of the importance of professional autonomy seems fundamentally to be about the assertion of political authority and control. Despite the exponential production of guidelines, judgment remains intrinsic to clinical practice. No evidence is absolute and every decision remains a gamble in the face of a range of probabilities and possibilities. Now, politicians understand this, although do, they do not often admit as much, because political decisions have exactly the same quality. Most patients understand this too, and perhaps most explicitly in relation to cigarette smoking. Because despite the simplistic rhetoric of almost all health promotion, literature, patients are aware that every decision to stop smoking or to continue is a gamble, albeit against different odds. And this is understandable because almost everyone has personal knowledge of at least one heavy smoker who has lived to a respectable old age. And more sadly, of a fit non-smoker, of a young non-smoker who has died tragically young. No one situation guarantees a particular outcome. All health professionals know that the same gamble underpins almost every treatment decision. This understanding is less accessible to ordinary patients because it's obscured by the medical science. But the very fact that many people choose to continue to smoke while enthusiastically taking medication for their blood pressure um, or for their um, cholesterol levels um, shows that their understanding of the gambles within medicine are somewhat tenuous. How are people to be properly informed and allowed the freedom to make their own decisions? Too easily compliant adherence to guidelines stifles responsible practice. 
And further, the simplistic linear reasoning which lies behind the algorithms of choice uh, of clinical guidelines actively encourages defensive and inflexible care. Now, politicians must always put the needs of the population above those of the individual. Clinicians, if they are to retain their trust of their patients, must necessarily do the reverse. There is an irre ir irreconcilable conflict between societal fairness and sensitivity to individual need. Population-based public health objectives with centralized control and a strong emphasis on cost-effectiveness and equity can damage and detract from the individual focus of patient-centered care. Politicians and policymakers tend to regard the healthcare system as instrumental to the end of a healthier and longer living population. And they ignore the intrinsic value of healthcare as expressing society's commitment to the welfare of its citizens and constituting in and of itself a societal good. The former objectifies patients as the recipients of health care, whereas the latter responds explicitly to the subjectivity of patients. Much of the political history of the last century demonstrates how easily utilitarianism at policy level can degenerate into the coercion of individuals. But the great comfort in the face of all of this is that none of us knows exactly what will happen to us tomorrow, any more than Montaigne 400 years ago. We know a lot about probability, but probability is a long way from certainty. People do not always get the result predicted by their lifestyle. We are only just beginning to understand the power of the human mind to influence the functioning of the body and the way that both happiness and despair can affect prognosis. So I want to end with this quotation from the American philosopher Martha Nussbaum. The human being who appears to be thrilling and wonderful may turn out at the same time to be monstrous in its ambition to simplify and control the world. Contingency, an object of terror and loathing, may turn out to be at the same time wonderful, constitutive of what makes human life beautiful and thrilling. Because we don't know what will happen to... It's because, the only thing that makes life possible is our uncertainty about the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.